So yeah. So can you see my uh, cursor? I'm moving it around near the butterfly. Yes. Yes. Ah. Yes. 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 Okay. That's good. Yeah. So I'll use that as a pointer. Okay. Okay. One minute. Stream one enough. Stream one enough. Okay. So yeah. Uh, that's all. We can. I, I think we can start at uh, three o'clock. Yeah, uh, I'm not starting now. That's okay. I'm just testing it out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. What I did was I made my cursor red and a little larger, so it should be more yeah. clear. Yeah. Yeah. It's visible now. Yeah. So we're currently on live on YouTube and Facebook too because so so we are just okay. Sorry, I didn't get that. You ah, okay? Live? Yeah, yeah. We currently uh, live on YouTube and uh, Facebook. Okay. All right. So yes. Uh, How was the condition there in COVID? In Trivandrum? Yeah. Well, this week it's a little better than last week. Okay. But uh, so far our campus has been uh, spared because we are remote. Oh. But uh, there are cases nearby 10 kilometers away. There's a small yeah. cluster. Oh. So I guess it's a matter of time before it comes here. Oh, okay. Uh, can we start? You want me to start now? Yeah, we can start. It's three o'clock. It's not at three, but if you want me to, I can start. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, then we can wait for. Shall we wait for three minutes? Yeah, yeah, we can. We can wait. Yeah. Small outpost. What was that, Neva? That small outpost is there, no? One small building, white with the red tiles. The last, the last one. Oh, that's the, uh, in my uh, slide, right? So yeah. that is a water tower. Uh, I, On the left, no? That's uh, one of the water towers. This applies to the academic area. Uh -huh. uh, it's new. I have not seen it before. You would have seen it. You would have seen it from a different angle, so you would not recognize. Yeah, it's it's right behind biology building. Oh, I see. Uh...
YouTube otra vez, ¿no? Hello. Hola, ¿sá? ¿Qué es Ya, ya, ya. I'll give a small introduction before start. Okay, okay. Can you get started? Okay. okay. Yeah. So, good, good evening, all. I am Shahir Ali. Uh, welcome to fifth talk of Samiksha webinar series conducted by All Kerala Research Scholars Association. Kerala Forest Research Institute Unit. Uh, like our previous talk, this meet section is live on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, please use the comment box for asking your question. Uh, just so you are aware, uh, the duration of this talk is uh, 45, mi 45 minutes to uh, one hour, uh, then 15 minutes interactive section. I request everyone kindly mute your microphone till question section. Then uh, today's talk is about the ice sport of butterfly. From our childhood, we are fascinated and uh, very uh, attracted towards the spectacular colors and patterns of uh, butterfly wings. Uh, that, that makes a lot of questions uh, to me and to everybody, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure uh, today's talk will give an insight for answering all our questions about uh, this spectacular patterns and colors in scientifically. It is now my pleasure to in, uh, introduce Dr. Ullasa Kodundaramaya, who is Associated Professor in Aisha Trivandrum and Principal Invigilator in Vanessiri Evolutionary Ecology Lab. Dr. Ullasa completed PhD from Stockholm University and postdoctoral research from uh, Stockholm University and another from Cambridge University. Uh, currently, Currently, he working on uh, phylogenetics and biogeography of butterflies, uh, and also plant uh, insect interaction, uh, phenotypic plasticity, and life history traits of in butterflies, and prey predator interaction. And he also uh, all these uh, research aspects. And also, he he's an excellent photographer. Again, I welcome Dr. Lassa uh, from I said to Andrew. Uh, it's over to you, Lassa. Yeah, you can see. Okay. Thank you, Shihir. So, uh, all of you can hear me clearly, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll turn off my uh, webcam. It's not needed, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. so uh, first, let, let me thank the organizers for uh, organizing this and inviting me. I think it's a really nice venture, especially during these uh, very strange times. So it seems to be a nice series of talks. I'd uh, love to attend the others, but luckily they're all uh, on YouTube. So that's really nice. So it has a much bigger reach. Right, so I will talk about eye spots, these uh, circular markings. Uh, usually they're concentric circles of different colors. They're very conspicuous. Uh, so, but of course, some of them need not be concentric like the one I'm pointing here. So I'll, talk, I'll be talking mainly about these eye spots, specifically uh, eye spots on uh, Lepidopteran such as butterflies. Uh, so if you think of selective forces in nature, there are a few other selective forces which are as strong as predation. So predation is one of the strongest selective forces. And it's not surprising that so many of the adaptations in nature are to avoid being eaten. So a very common strategy uh, is crypsis or camouflage. 
So this is in fact uh, not just one strategy, but it's a range of different strategies. For example, here on the bottom left, you see a moth. Its color patterns are uh, very similar to that of the background. Here you have a lizard. So the one I'm pointing there on the upper half is a lizard. It looks very similar to a dried leaf. Here you have an owl, which is not very easily visible, but once the owl turns around, you can see its face. So it's much more visible. So all of these are various different strategies, rather various different sub strategies, uh, which are broadly all put together under uh, what is called as Crypsis. So all of these color patterns work by preventing either detection or recognition. For example, the moth here will probably not be detected at all. This lizard here may be detected, but the prey may not recognize or identify it as a, sorry, the predator may not identify it as a prey animal. So they can work in two broad ways. One is these color patterns may decrease attack probability or they can increase the time to attack or uh, what is called as attack latency. So in nature, even if they can only increase this attack latency by a little, that feature, that trait is probably going to be selected uh, because predation is such a strong selective force. So this is one example of uh, color patterns being used against predation, but I'll be talking about eye spots, which are also color patterns, but these are not cryptic patterns. These are very conspicuous features. They're very readily visible. They have strong contrast with the bodies of the prey animals themselves. And they're found in a range of animals. They're found in butterflies, as we saw. They're found in fish. They're found in these uh, skates and so on. So they're found in uh, aquatic organisms and terrestrial organisms, so very widespread. And for a long time, people have been interested in understanding why animals have eye spots. So here's an example of the diversity of eye spots within butterflies. So this is a small group of butterflies, uh, less than 100 species. But within this group, you have such amazing diversity. So all of these are photos of the hind wing, upper side. So you can see here, the eye spots are reduced to just a few small dots. Whereas in this case, it's really large. You can see this white in the middle, and this probably looks three-dimensional as if light is being reflected or if light is being bounced off. It, it gives a three-dimensional appearance. So this is fairly intricate. And then you have variation in I spot number, here you have only two, here you have two again, whereas here you have a series of eye spots, again here you have a series of eye spots. So there's variation in size, there's variation in number, there's variation in color patterns. And if there's selection acting on eye spots at all, it seems like this is this varies across species, across different predatory contexts, different habitats, and so on. So this got me interested in eye spots when I was a PhD student. So some of the work I'll be presenting today was done as part of my PhD and my postdoc work. And I'm also going to present work done by my master's student after I joined ICER uh, TVM. But I'll also use some data from other studies. Uh, the whole idea of my talk will be to uh, talk about will be to discuss how hypotheses are being tested specifically in the context of uh, how eye spots are used by prey animals against predation so the organizers said the idea is to encourage or inspire people to get into question based research uh, rather than just doing natural history so i'll be focusing on that i'll be talking about simple experiments uh, coming up with simple hypotheses, coming up with competing hypotheses, and how different people have studied basically the same
question. They've asked the same question, but they've done it in different ways. They got slightly different results. But all of these add together to give us a better understanding of how iSpots function against predators. So in butterflies, uh, there are two broad types of eye spots. One is these really large and solitary, solitary uh, eye spots, which are, you know, which are independent. There are no flanking eye spots. Then you have these smaller eye spots, which are found in a series. So these are serially arranged, and these typically tend to be small because obviously they can't get really large. There are flanking eye spots. There's a, uh, there's a restriction on how large they can become. So there are two broad hypotheses for the, to explain the presence of these eye spots. This is specifically in relation to predation. Uh, one is the deflection hypothesis. So the idea is that there are some conspicuous markings on the bodies of prey animals which are uh, found on parts of the bodies that are not really important for survival or reproduction. For example, if you take this lizard here, its tail is very brightly colored, very conspicuous, and a predator attacking this lizard would, you know, would be looking at the tail first. It, it, the tail catches the attention of the predators, and they may attack the tail rather than the body, the, the trunk or the head, and the lizard can lose its tail and can regrow its tail. So in that sense, the tail is less vital compared to the head or the trunk. So if the lizard can deflect attacks to the tail, its fitness increases compared to when attacks are towards the anterior parts. Similarly, uh, the idea is that eye spots such as those found on this butterfly, this mycalesis butterfly. So these are found along the wing margins. And if you look at the, the body of the butterfly, the main body, the thorax and the head and so on, they're all brownish. Uh, so they are more cryptic, but these eye spots are very conspicuous. So the predator may be distracted by these eye spots and may start attacking these eye spots rather than the body and then the butterfly can escape but the wing is torn that's all right because uh, even though the wings can't regrow the butterfly still is alive it can mate it can you know it can feed and reproduce and so on so that's the basic idea of the deflection hypothesis and then there's the intimidation hypothesis this is to explain the presence of really large solitary eye spots for example the kind of eye spots we find on this uh, Temperate butterfly is found in uh, Europe. It's, it's a common butterfly there. So you see this really conspicuous, brightly colored, uh, big eye spots, very striking. On the underside, this butterfly, this peacock butterfly, on the underside is cryptically colored. So the interesting thing about this butterfly is that it's one of the few butterflies which hibernates during winter in the adult stage. You know, a lot of, well, all animals that live in uh, in the temperate regions, they need to survive the winter, either as eggs or as adults. So a lot of the butterflies, they survive as pupae and so on. But there are some butterflies that uh, emerge before winter and they stay as adults during winter and then again they start flying during the next spring. So during winter, this butterfly hides under you know, logs of uh, tree logs, uh, inside crevices within fallen trees. Sometimes it goes into attics of houses and so on. Uh, that's when these cryptic undersides are helpful because the butterflies Butterflies generally tend to rest with their wings closed. But when a predator detects this butterfly, even during winter when the temperatures are really cold, the butterfly suddenly flicks open its wings to reveal these beautiful, striking eye spots on the upper side. And the butterfly 
keeps opening and closing its wings repeatedly. So it's flicking its wings open and close to display these uh, eye spots. And the idea here, uh, rather the idea that has been discussed for a long time is that these eye spots, they mimic the eyes of the predator's own predator. For example, if it's a little bird that's trying to attack this butterfly, these the bird may be fooled into thinking that these are the eyes of its own enemy. It could be a large bird or a snake, for example. And then there's fear and there's hesitation to attack because of which uh, they either not attack at all or the latency to attack may increase. So which gives the butterfly a fitness advantage. So this is called eye mimicry, the eye mimicry hypothesis. And this has been discussed for a very long time, especially in the context of this peacock butterfly. But this was experimentally tested using a very nice experiment, a very simple experiment in Christoph Wieklund's group in Stockholm University. So what they did was they took live butterflies and they had two treatments. In one treatment, they used a marker and painted out the eye spots, there are four of them on the upper side. In another treatment, they used the same uh, marker but painted out other parts of the wing. So you might wonder why they painted out other parts of the wings. So you know, one of the important rules or guidelines for experimental design is that you should always try to change one variable at a time. So we have different treatments. You should always change one variable so that if you get an effect, you can attribute the effect to that particular variable. If they had not painted out other parts of the wing, and if they had found a difference in predation between these two treatments, then one is not sure whether it's because of the presence of eye spots, rather the visibility of eye spots, or because of these markings, these uh, whatever marker pen markings. Right? So this is a well controlled experiment. And they used blue tits as a predator. So they released blue tits into an arena where uh, each blue tit was exposed to one butterfly. Uh, it could be either an eye spotted one or a one without eye spots visible. And what they found was for the butterflies without eye spots, five out of 10 survived. On the other hand, the butterflies for which eye spots were clearly visible, nine out of nine survived. So there's a hundred percent survival rate. So the sample size is not huge. So they use very few uh, butterflies and for each butterfly obviously they used a different bird but the effect was so strong there's 100 percent survival here whereas in the other treatment there's 50 percent survival so this gave us some evidence that eye spots can increase survival in nature right. so now one can ask this question is it just the eye spots or is it the entire color pattern? You know, there are not just eye spots, they also have these red and other markings. And you know, one could ask this question, there could be something else apart from eye spots. And also they have this display where they have this behavior where they flick their wings open and closed. So this is broadly called a startle display or a daematic display and this is found in many animals. So for example in this moth here usually the hind wings are hidden under the forewings but when there's a threat of predation they suddenly flick their forewings upwards to reveal these very brightly colored hind wings. So 
this is an example of a startled display. The, the, the idea is that the predators are startled by the sudden displays of conspicuous colors. It's that in several other butterflies as well. For example, in this uh, common butterfly in temperate regions, Papilia macron, uh, when they are disturbed, they suddenly flick their wings open. On the upper side, they have these very contrasting, brightly colored patterns, uh, which might potentially scare away predators. So this is what was tested by Martin Olofsson. So he was a student of Christoph Wieklund. So he designed a simple experiment where he has a bird. This is a blue tit. So the bird is allowed, bird is released into an arena and it, it usually lands on this branch, a perch. It comes up here. Then it's given a choice between two prey. So one is a dead butterfly with its wings open. So this has been freshly killed. And the other one is a live butterfly, which is doing its normal you know, display of flicking its wings open and closed. So they looked at latency to attack either of the butterflies. And of course, they change the positions of the uh, dead and live butterflies between treatments and so on. So what they found, so in this case, you have uh, on the y-axis, you have latency to attack in seconds. So this one is the latency to attack the live butterfly. And this is the latency to attack a dead butterfly. So the re results were statistically significantly different. So the butterfly, the birds took more time to attack the live butterflies. Mm -hmm. So remember the only difference between the two, mm, at least in terms of behavior, is that this one has its wings completely visible. Whereas this one, it's initially closed, but when the bird comes here, it starts flicking its wings open and it displays the same color pattern. So this shows that the behavior itself has an effect, right? So when you have conspicuous colors on the dorsal side, on the upper side, if you have this wing flicking behavior, so this itself can be effective, right? So now one can ask the question, in the case of uh, these butterflies, peacock butterflies, so how important is the daematic behavior per se? Is a daematic behavior really needed for the eye spots to be effective? One can argue if they did not have the sudden, uh, uh, you know, sudden display of eye spots, if the eye spots are constantly visible, they may not be very effective because uh, birds may look at them and realize that, you know, this doesn't seem like the eyes of my own enemy. They may figure out and they may start attacking the butterfly, right? So I was interested in this and uh, I designed an experiment again with Christo Wicklund's group. So this was during my PhD times. So we designed an experiment uh, where we used these butterflies, Junonia almana. This is called the peacock pansy butterfly. So this is a tropical butterfly. So we bought butterflies. We could buy butterflies from Malaysia. They, they were sent to Sweden where I was doing my PhD. And we used uh, a predator. This is uh, the great tit, also called the great tit sometimes. So this is a common bird which is found in areas where Junonia almana is also found. So they're also found in Asia. So we designed this simple experiment where two butterflies were uh, exposed to, rather the birds were exposed to these two butterflies. So in one, the eye spots were painted out. In the other, the eye spots were visible. And so what is not visible in this picture is the experimental uh, room. So this is, uh, a small room, a soundproof room uh, with, with an opening where we could release the birds. So the birds were fed on mealworms. You can see one little mealworm here. So these are used as bait and fishing. 
So birds were fed on mealworms in their cages and they were starved for a while before the experiment started. And then when the experiment started, they were released into this room, the soundproof room. There were no windows. So the bird, so on this side, what you can't see here, there's a large, there's a tall stick with some horizontal sticks attached to it. So this acted as a perch. So once we release a bird, the bird used to be very agitated and you know, the bird used to go find the stick, sit on one of these horizontal perches and calm down. And then once it's sitting on this perch, it could see this petri dish with a white background and a live mealworm crawling around. So the mealworm is very conspicuous against this white background. The bird can see it quite well. So bird flies down. We made a little perch, one more here. It would take the mealworm, sit on this perch, finish eating the mealworm. And now it's hungry because it has been starved. And it associates this log with food. So it starts moving around on this log, keeps coming. Once it reaches this end of the log, here, there's a choice between two of these butterflies. So the butterflies were, let's see. So this is a close up of the butterflies. So in fact, these were not real butterflies. We took the wings, we cut them out and pasted them onto this little piece of wood. And instead of the body of the butterfly, we had these mealworms. Okay. So this is a treatment where we had painted some other part of the painted out some, some other part of the wings. And in, this is a treatment where the eye spots have been painted out. Right. So the birds now have a two choice test. So we can see which one they take first. If eye spots are effective, even without the daymatic behavior, then we should find that more birds attack this one, the one without eye spots. Right? And if the eye spots are not effective, then half of the birds should go for this and half of the birds should go for this. So let me pause here and can I ask the organizers if uh, you're able to hear me clearly? Uh, yes, Leza. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks because... Uh, Hello? Yeah, that's fine because I don't get any feedback so I just had to ensure that uh, okay. people are listening to me. All right, so now this is a simple two choice yeah. test. Right, so here's a result for the number of first attacks. So we had 35 birds and each of them was exposed to a pair of uh, butterflies. So out of them, 25 went for the one without eye spots. This is what they attacked first. And then the remaining 10 went for the one with eye spots. So the result is not as strong as in the previous experiment with uh, Inakis, but still the results are uh, statistically significantly different. Now, one can also look at latency to attack. So when birds first attacked the one with eye spots, on average, they took 1.3 minutes to attack the one without eye spots. On the other hand, when they attacked the one without eye spots first, they took almost twice the time, two and a half minutes, to attack the one with eye spots. So there's a strong difference in latency to attack as well. So here's a video. Uh, the bird is coming in from the left. So you saw that the bird jumped back after looking at this butterfly. So this is the one with eye spots. Now the bird went to the other butterfly and it had no hesitation. It picked out the mealworm, it's feeding on it. So now you'll see that the bird will come back to this other butterfly with eye spots. It was again seemingly scared. We don't know what's happening in the brain of the bird, but it seems like it's scared because it jumps back. 
So in this particular uh, trial, the bird never returned to this one. You know, it was this is a replay now, right? Okay. So I spots function without the need for dematic behaviors. Now one can ask the question: Is this uh, hesitation to attack I spots? Is it innate, or do they learn? Do they look at snakes and other enemies and once they're exposed to their predators do they learn that these eye spots are dangerous or is it innate as soon as they're born you know they have this innate fear of uh, fear or whatever hesitation to attack eye spot like uh, patterns so this was another experiment we uh, designed so this was done with uh, sami merilaita so this is Sami Merilaita. This work was done in Finland. So we used pied flycatchers. We used them because we had a small population of uh, uh, flight catchers which were naive. So the eggs had been collected. They had hatched under laboratory conditions. So they had only seen humans who fed them and so on. So they had not seen their natural predators. And we wanted to ask whether these naive ones, which have not been exposed to predators in the wild, do they also have an aversion towards eye spots? So here again, we used a similar setup as in the peacock pansy butterfly experiment, but we used the peacock butterfly. So these are a bit confusing. So this is the inactive which Christopher Wicklund used for his first experiment. So again, we cut out the wings and used a mealworm instead of the real body of the butterfly. And these were pasted on a piece of card. So here I've just depicted two treatments, one with all four eye spots visible, one without eye spots, but uh, the real experiment was a little more complicated. We looked at the effect of number and so on. So here in this graph, you have time to attack in seconds. This is nothing but attack latency on the y-axis. So first let's look at these two bars. So each bird was given two butterflies, either the one with spots first or the one with no spots first. So one half of the butterflies were given, one half of the birds were given uh, butterflies with spots first. So when the spotted butterfly was given first, uh, and when you compare that to what happened when they attacked the one with no spot second, so you see that the latency to attack the spotted one, the eye spotted one, is higher. And then when they attack the no spotted one second, the latency is lesser. Again, if you look at the birds for which the no spots were given first, attack latency is less, but then second when they're given the one with spots, attack latency is more. So what this tells us is that irrespective of whether they saw the eye spotted one first or the one without eye spots first, irrespective of that, they still take a longer time to attack the one with spots. And this effect is there even in naive birds. So they innately somehow seem to avoid eye spot like patterns. So all of these they seem to suggest that this eye mimicry hypothesis is, is indeed a good explanation to uh, explain the presence of these eye spots in nature. So this was Sami Merilaita in Finland. So now enter Martin Stevens. So he had a completely different perspective. So he looked at it, you know, from square one without being biased towards the eye mimicry hypothesis. So he wanted to ask what could be other reasons why eye spots are effective. And he did not use the same approach as what we did. So we used one predator and we used a laboratory experiment where we could observe what's happening. On the other hand, Martin Stevens and his group, they came up with a very different kind of experimental setup. So what they did was, they took these triangular card pieces and they printed different patterns on them. So here you have 
here you have two basically these are two filled circles they are black surrounded by whitish circles it's not very clear here you have uh, orangish circles so now these are presumably something that mimic the shape of a moth a lot of moths are roughly triangular and a lot of moths have eye spots so what we could what he could do is he could paste or pin hundreds or even thousands of these on trees and use a mealworm either on top of the cart or sticking out under and then once you have hundreds of these you can uh, you know you can get many many more predation events compared to what we could get in the lab and you can test the effect of small variations for example on the top left here so here the a is a treatment where there are these black spots c is where you have gray spots so the shape is the same the size is the same but the contrast of the spot with its background the background is nothing but the triangular card so the contrast with the background is higher here whereas the contrast with the background is lesser here similarly in this case the white contrasts with the gray but this pale gray contrasts less this contrast is weaker right so now this can be used to test the effect of contrast with the background and then one can now look at internal contrast so internal contrast is a contrast within the spots for example here you have a white ring within it you have a black spot so there's internal contrast within this stimulus within this color pattern right so here again you have different shapes and so on so now all of these here in this box on the top left they comprise one experiment these are the five treatments uh, stevens's group they could go out and pin 100 or even 1000 of each treatment and they could look at survival of the male worms attached to them and they could use a more refined technique compared to what we use so they could use uh, survival analysis so basically here you have on the x-axis you have time in hours on the y-axis you have survival probability so when they're all kept out initially 100 percent of them will survive and each line here represents one treatment uh, i think something is missing let me exit and the right part of my screen is missing uh, organizer uh, uh, yeah the, the right part where i'm pointing my cursor can you see anything or is it just a blank uh, it's just blank just blank right so i think something happened with the screen let me uh, present okay. once again yeah 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 it's, just, yeah. it's okay Okay, now do you see this part? Yeah. Okay, yes. that's good. Great. So now, so on the x-axis we have time in hours in this case, and on the y-axis we have uh, survival probability. So initially it's hundred percent all treatments, you know, everything because we have just left them out there. All of the mealworms survive, and you can go out and count how many of them survive the next day. In this case, at twenty-four hours they went out and checked how many of them survived and you know and then again after 48 hours so this curve here is the survival probability for one treatment across time and obviously if a curve is higher up here in this graph the survival probability for that treatment is higher so this is a more refined more uh, sophisticated technique it allows you to uh, you know you, you can get you have more power to test uh, to find out smaller differences 
which we could not have done using our setup. So what they found was that high contrast with the background is important and high internal pattern contrast is important. On the other hand, shape and so on were not so important. Okay. So what they concluded in this paper was that, so I'll read it out. We conclude that contrary to popular belief, eye spots can be effective predator deterrents without mimicking eyes. So if you if you think about the eye mimicry hypothesis, these patterns here, they don't really look like eyes, whereas these, they look much more like eyes. So they did not find such differences. So even these, uh, uh, these are, it's a rhombus here, you know, these patterns were also effective. These are definitely not looking like eyes. These are much more like eyes, but these were also effective. And so after, I'm not going to details of all of these experiments, but they, there was sufficient evidence from their experiments to conclude that eye mimicry need not be the reason why eye spots are effective. So then began this debate about whether it's simply the conspicuousness, that's what Stevens et al. suggested. So they're simply conspicuous features, so predators avoid them, or there's another, there was another camp which talked about eye mimicry, that eye spots are effective because of eye mimicry. So that's when we started the work at ICTVM. Oh, before that, I should probably mention this other experiment quickly. So in this experiment, what Stevens et al. did, this was a follow-up experiment to the previous one. So they looked at the effect of total area of the stimuli. So in this case, uh, these are three spots with the same total area as, uh, well, I think the total area is more than this one single eye spot, but this one single eye spot has the same area as the two of these eye spots combined. And then these are two eye spots, but they're larger compared to these two smaller eye spots. And here is a single small eye spot. And here they had two circles and two squares, which had the same area as the two circles. And then they had various other treatments where they had two squares, which had the same perimeter as the circles. They had these rectangles which had the same area or the same perimeter as the circles and so on. So using all of these, they concluded that what really matters is the total area of the stimuli. It doesn't matter whether it's single, it doesn't matter whether there are three or two. As long as the stimulus is large, the total area is more, it's effective against predation. I'll skip this part, running a bit short of time. So now, this was a time when uh, I had a master student, Ritwika, who is now in Tufts University. So we designed a series of experiments to test the eye mimicry and conspicuousness hypothesis. So we took uh, these artificial wing patterns. So these were printed out and we cut out these patterns. So this was basically derived from uh, the peacock pansy butterfly on which I had worked on during my PhD. And so we did two choice tests and we used chickens as the predators. Here, we, the chickens had a choice between these, uh, uh, I'll call these butterflies for now, for the sake of simplicity. They had a choice between butterflies with zero eye spots and with two normal sized eye spots. And here, so I say one because on each wing there's a single eye spot. In the next experiment, we had the same one as what we have here. So there's one eye spot on each wing, but we compared survival of this to a treatment where there were five small eye spots. So the total area of these five small eye spots, they together had the same area as a single large eye spot. So if area is what matters, then there should be no difference between this and this, right? And again, to complete this set, we compared the one 
without i spots against one with five i spots. So here are the results. As expected, first, the one with i spots, they received significantly fewer first attacks. On the other hand, in this case, the one with a single i spot on each wing, this treatment received significantly fewer first attacks compared to this treatment where you know, the total area of eye spots was the same as this one, right? So this seems to suggest that this it's not simply about total area. So our results were quite different to what Stevens found. So this is in support of the eye mimicry hypothesis. And we found no difference between zero eye spots and these five small eye spots. Remember that in Stevens's case, they argued that three eye spots were just as effective as one large eye spot, you know, if they were the same area. So that doesn't seem to be the case in our experiment. Then we looked at the effect of area directly. So is there a difference between large eye spots and small eye spots? So here, these are small eye spots where we took these eye spots and manipulated them such that they're half the size. So this will tell us whether there's an effect of area and then we took this eye spot and cut it up into three pieces. All of this was done in Photoshop. So we cut it up into three pieces and put them back together in a very artificial shape, which looked like a fan. So now, if it's eye mimicry, the number of attacks here should be less compared to the number, number of attacks here, because this is definitely not like an eye. So first here, there was no effect of area. So large eye spots were just as effective as the small ones. So here, to our surprise, there was no difference between this thing that is looking like a proper eye spot versus that something that looked like a fan. So they were now surprised, right? So if it's an eye mimicry hypothesis, rather if it's eye mimicry that is the mechanism, then you expect that number of attacks here would be less. It was not the case. Then we looked at symmetry. So here in one treatment, we had symmetric two eye spots, you know, on the left and right. Whereas in the asymmetric treatment, we had one eye spot and one fan-like thing. And of course, in, in some of them, they were switched left and right. And we looked at this treatment where the eye spots were paired, on, you had a pair of eye spots versus unpaired. You had one large eye spot, but the total area of this eye spot was the same as the combined area of the two eye spots. So this would be similar to what Stevens did here. If you took this one and if you took these two, if the total area of these two is the same as this one, that would be the equivalent of this experiment, right? So first here, looking at symmetry, we were surprised again. Symmetry played no role. The symmetric treatment received the same number of attacks as the asymmetric treatment. Surprise, again, this does not support the eye mimicry hypothesis. Now, the paired butterflies, rather the paired markings, they received fewer attacks compared to one which were unpaired. Remember that the area is the same. The only thing is that here they are paired. There are two stimuli, whereas here there's only one stimulus. So when there are two, you get a stronger effect. So putting all of this together, you know, when you have uh, two eye spots versus no eye spots, the one with two eye spots are better. But when you have two eye spots versus 10, one with two eye spots is better zero versus 10, you know, there's no difference. If you take two large eye spots versus two small eye spots, there's no difference. Two large eye spots versus two completely artificial shapes, which have the same area and the same size, no difference. Symmetric versus asymmetric, no difference. But on the other hand, when it's paired compared to being unpaired, there's a difference. So what we concluded from this was that the shape, size don't really matter. 
What matters is that it should be found in a pair. So if you have two of these or two of these, so as long as it's found in a pair, it, they function against predators. In this case, it was chickens. So what we suggest is that eye spots could have initially evolved as two conspicuous markings. It doesn't matter what shape they were, what color they were, as long as they were conspicuous, uh, they could have had some effect against predators. Well, as long as they were conspicuous and they were found as a pair. So then later on, selection by other predators could have acted on them and they could have become more and more intricate to become these seemingly three-dimensional eye spots. They're not surprising because, uh, you know, paired markings, they probably stimulate the two eyes of the chickens or birds much more strongly. So now coming back to the deflection hypothesis. So I talked about these serially arranged eye spots. So this, this idea originated from uh, Brakefield and Larson long back. So what they, uh, well, there are a lot of butterflies which have these eye spots, serial eye spots during the wet season, but in the dry season, the same species has no eye spots at all. So what they suggested was that in the dry season, they use crypsis, so they blend against the dry leaf background, which is abundant in the dry season. But in the wet season, everything is green, fresh and green. So they cannot really blend in so easily. So then they use these deflective eye spots. I'll skip this part about plasticity. Right. So we tested this again. Uh, this work was done with Merilitha's group. So we used blue tits. And so we use these, this was the background and we gave them these triangular cards with printed patterns which resemble eye spots. So these eye spots are found on one side, either on the left or right, and they were either small or they were large. So the idea is that, uh, rather the hypothesis we were testing is that when the eye spots were small, the birds should tend to attack the side of the triangle, the half of the triangle where eye spots are found. But when the eye spots are large, we don't necessarily, we should not necessarily find that deflective effect. So uh, I'll, I think I'm running a bit short of time, so I'll, uh, I won't take you through these results in detail, but suffice it to say that when you compare these white bars, you, take, you compare this versus this white bar, the 3mm one, you find that there's a difference, a statistically significant difference. More birds attack the, rather there were more attacks directed towards the eye spotted side. So this is more compared to this one. But when you take the 6mm one, these are large eye spots, there's no difference between the eye spotted side versus the spotless side. So this tells us that eye spots are effective in deflection, but only when they are small. So there was another experiment which uh, tested this hypothesis and their results were even stronger. So this was uh, Martin Olofsson. I've talked about his work on daymatic behavior. So what he showed in an experiment is that under certain light conditions, all bird attacks are directed towards the head, towards the head and thorax. But under certain light conditions, most of the attacks are directed towards the wing margins. So this suggests that eye spots can be quite effective under particular light conditions in deflecting attacks away from the head. Okay, I think uh, I'll skip this last part, uh, which was about using phylogenies to test hypothesis. So maybe I'll stop here. Uh, hi, Ulla, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, we have a time. We can continue uh, uh, normally. OK, so let me do that. So I'll do it rather quickly uh, without going into too many details. So uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about using phylogenies to test hypothesis. 
using some of the work I've done. So here again, I'm going to use these butterfly eye spots. So here you have, uh, in the same group of butterflies, you have either serially arranged eye spots or solitarily arranged, solitary eye spots, which are large. So each eye spot is found at the center of a wing compartment. A wing compartment is a space that is bounded by two wing veins. Right. So now you can have uh, a maximum of seven, or maybe if you count this uh, wing compartment, you can have a maximum of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine eye spots perhaps. But typically, eye spots are found in compartments one to six in this group of butterflies. So you can now give some nomenclature to eye spots. I've called them one, two, three, four, five, six for the sake of convenience. So serially arranged eye spots are found in compartments one to six. The ones in individual eyes, uh, ones with individual or solitary eye spots are found only in compartments two and five. So this is what I already showed. So now, if you look at the diversity of species and the wing patterns, uh, you can identify four configurations or arrangements. Mm -hmm. One is serial arrangement and then individual, you can have those species which have a single eye spot in compartment five, those species which have two eye spots in two and five, those which have eye spots in one, two and five. So in this case, the eye spots in one and two are fused together to form one large eye spot, but it has eye spots in one, two and five. And then there are species which have eye spots in one, two, five and six. So one can ask the question, how did these different configurations evolve? Uh, one hypothesis could be that they started with a single eye spot and then they added one more here, they added uh, they could have started with eye spots in five, added an eye spot in two, added one more eye spot in one, and then added one more in six. So there could have been a gradual increase in eye spots. Another possibility is that they started with serially arranged eye spots and they lost eye, some eye spots and the remaining eye spots, they became larger so that they could effectively intimidate their predators. So this is a hypothesis I tested. Uh, the reason I favored this hypothesis compared to you know, the hypothesis where they added uh, eye spots is simply because if you look at the distribution, if you look at the phylogeny, you find this to be uh, much more common. It's found in ancestors as well. So I thought perhaps they started with this and they ended up with this. So this was a a hypothesis I wanted to test using a phylogeny. So basically, the hypothesis is that if you reconstruct the phylogeny and map the eye spot configurations, you should find that the serial eye spots, rather the species with serial eye spots, are more ancestral, and then they will switch to solitary eye spots. And if you think in terms of selection pressure, if you assume that selection for you know an anti-predatory effect where the intimidate predator if that is a selection pressure then you expect that once they switch from serial to individual they don't revert back to a serial configuration right so these are two very simple hypotheses these are two working hypotheses i tested using an available phylogeny so what i found was uh, surprising well, at least to me, uh, here, the ones marked in the branches in black are the ones that, rather, uh, well, the ones that have serial eye spots. The ones that are marked in white are the ones which don't, the species which don't have eye spots, you can ignore them. So the serially arranged eye spots, they're found here, they're found in a few species here, some here and again here. So in, in fact, this is not even a single origin. It's evolved multiple times. And the remaining patterns, you have these gray and white, gray and black bars here. You have white and black bars. You have these hash markings and you have this plain gray. All of these are different 
types of uh, solitary configurations. You have this one, one, two, five, and so on. So I was surprised that each of these configurations has evolved more than once in the phylogeny, and there's no clear cut pattern at all. So this uh, phylogeny was based on a three gene molecular phylogeny. So this was a time when three genes were enough to reconstruct phylogenies. These days, I think reviewers ask for tens of genes. Right. So what I could conclude was that all of these five configurations, they have evolved more than once. So there's convergent evolution. And if you look at the phylogeny overall, there's a pattern of increase in ice spots as well as decrease in ice spots. In other words, there's been a sw there have been switches from solitary to serial and serial to solitary. So what this tells us is that the selection on ice spots is not as simple as I first imagined, where they start with serial ice spots and then their selection for intimidation and they become large. But it's across the phylogeny, it's quite dynamic. In some species, intimidating ice spots are selected. In some species, serial ice spots are selected. In some continents, in some, uh, for example, in Africa, they tend to have mainly serial ice spots. Whereas in Asia, there seems to be a tend towards evolving uh, solitary ice spots. So the predator community might be different and so on. So finally, here's another simple uh, hypothesis I tested. So if you have serial ice spots and these solitary ice spots in the same group of butterflies, uh, are there differences in the positions of these ice spots? So if these are serially, uh, if these function as deflective markings, you expect that there's some selection to be pushed away towards the margins. On the other hand, if these are solitary ice spots, there's no real push, rather there's no selective pressure to be pushed towards the margin. So they may just retain their ancestral states and be more central. And secondly, if the number is less, if they are solitary, you expect that they are much larger compared to when they are serial. Again, this can be tested using a phylogeny. So these are the predictions. Ice spots are larger in a solitary configuration than in a serial configuration. And there should be a negative relationship between ice spot size and proximity to wing margin. Basically, smaller ice spots should be uh, Small, smaller ice spots should be serially arranged and they should be closer to the wing margin. So there's a simple, uh, there, are, there are various ways in which this can be tested. I use what is called as a phylogenetic paired t-test. And I'll skip the part about how I actually collected the data, but there was support for this. There was a negative correlation between size and proximity to wing margin. So smaller ice spots tend to be closer to the wing margin. And I must mention that I'm talking about the center of the ice spots. It's not the you know, boundary of the ice spot, which is closer. It's the center of the ice spots, which is closer to the wing margin. So the smaller ones tend to be closer to the wing margin, which suggests that the smaller ones are functioning against uh, predators, uh, you know, through deflection and overall I found that solitary ice spots were larger. So if they're uh, alone, they tend to be larger. So that possibly could be selection, you know, against predation through intimidation. Okay, so that's all I had. I thank the organizers and the funding agencies. And before we open up to questions, I would uh, encourage all the students to go through the series of articles by Professor Gadakkar. So he's written this uh, series of articles in the journal Resonance, how to design experiments in animal behavior. He talks about hypothesis testing, uh, which is not just about animal behavior, the same principles apply to all fields of ecology and evolution. He talks about how one can use brain power mainly and a little bit of money and resources to design very nice experiments. Please go through this if you have time. All right. Thank you, Shishir.
yeah Th- thank you lasa uh, thanks a lot for accepting our uh, invitation session uh, in your busy schedule uh, and the inspiring and insightful uh, talk uh, i think uh, now we can go for uh, question and answer section the people who are in uh, google meet can ask the question directly uh, please switch on your mic and ask question other question came in youtube will convey with you later hello yeah i am online yeah so there is a question in comment box uh, are okay, these export I'm... visible only okay. if yeah yeah so uh, that's Can a I... good question yeah. so many of these i so, so the question i'll repeat it for everyone are the ispots visible only in the visible spectrum so basically do the ispots have Uh, do they reflect in uh, wavelengths that are not visible to human beings right so uh, yes the answer is they have reflectance in uh, wavelengths which are not visible to humans uh, many of the eye spots have uh, uv reflectance and birds can see uv well and in fact the can you still see my presentation you can still see that right yeah. Yes, yes. Shared. So when I was talking about Martin Ulofsson's experiments on deflection here, so these eye spots here, the central white dot is strongly UV reflective, and it seems like that UV reflectance is what really deflects uh, predatory attacks towards the margins. You know, that seems to be very important. It's not so much. the yellow and black rings so at least this is what seems to be the case with respect to birds bird attacks yeah there's another question in uh okay. so maybe i can i can read well there's one more on the chat box maybe i'll read that yeah. out yeah yeah yes yes you can the conspicuous nature of eye spots help them to outrun predators such as small birds but it they may also invite other predators such as mammals or large birds so it's again a very good question so this is probably a a very general question which applies not just to eye spots but it also applies to other color patterns which function against predation but which are conspicuous you know there are stripes and so on which also are thought to function against predators so it's true so the one color pattern or one anti predatory strategy may not function against all predators but ultimately what matters is the net selection by the predator community right so if most of the predators are deterred or most of the predators are fooled by something then that trait will be selected right but if a lot of predators learn to use eye spot to spot butterflies and start attacking butterflies then eye spot would not be selected yeah there's another question in comment box what is your opinion regarding eye spot like marking in uh wings of dragonfly hmm. so eye spot like markings are found in a lot of insects they found in katydids dragonflies moths and so on so as i was talking about uh, as i was saying uh, when i was talking about ritvika mukherjee's experiments where we looked at the effect of pairedness right so a lot of these markings as long as they are paired they in other words they are found on both wings and they are conspicuous they probably have some effect against predation against predators at least some kinds of predators so possibly they are also involved as a, in you know in functioning against predators possibly but one has to do some experiments to test that does that answer your question yeah i think okay yeah so there is another question in uh, youtube uh, what about the change changes in uh, predator strategy against this eye spot any mm-hmm. coevolutionary pattern is a okay that's a, that's a very good question so uh, 
I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the concept called frequency dependent selection. So uh, if you're not, and if you're interested, you can look it up. So these eye spots uh, are an example of negative frequency dependent selection. So, so basically, imagine this, if all species in all butterflies in a region have eye spots, right? So then the predators will quickly learn that these eye spots are harmless. We are not talking of intimidating eye spots, right? So predators will quickly learn because there's so much opportunity to learn. But when the frequency of prey animals with eye spots is low, that's when eye spots are effective, right? So the same is the case for deflective eye spots. Imagine a scenario where all butterflies or all prey, uh, all moths and butterflies in a habitat are ones with serially arranged deflective eye spots, then predators will have, will have much more opportunity to learn that these are useless, you know, a piece of wing is not tasty, is not nutritious. So they learn to ignore the eye spots and start attacking the body. So this is where negative frequency dependent selection comes into picture. In terms of coevolution, yes, there is selection pressure on the predators to ignore these. So in a sense, the prey are trying to fool the predators and their selection pressure for the predators to call this bluff and ignore these cues and go for the body. Right? So in that sense, there is a co-evolutionary scenario, although I don't think anybody has really studied this. Okay. Yeah. So there's another question. Uh -huh. Are there any events in which eye sports are being exploited by the predator to notice them? Yeah. So I think this is related to a previous question. Somebody asked something very similar. So uh, as far as I know, there are no studies which have demonstrated this, but it seems quite reasonable to assume that there are predators which have learned that these eye spots are not harmful and they in fact use these eye spots to detect their prey, right? So it's possibly there out there in nature, but uh, you know, it needs to be tested. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a question in YouTube. Uh, would the difference and yours be lesser if the shape of the object was not a triangle, but a realistic butterfly wing shape like yours? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. the the best way to answer this is to go out there and do the experiment. But if you wanted me to take a guess, I would say probably the shape would shape of the rather the outline of the card, it probably should not have an effect. It would not have an effect. That's my feeling. Because even in our experiments, where we had this fan shape versus proper eye spots, we found no difference between the two, right? And we had uh, something that was in the shape of a butterfly. So I suspect it won't have an effect, but you never know. There could be an interaction between eye spot patterns and the outline, the shape of the prey. There could be. Yeah, yeah the same person asked about the predator difference. If we're using the different predator, what will... What That's will a very there? good question. So. Uh, in fact, one of the advantages with what uh, Martin Stevens did is that they're testing the effect of the entire predatory community. They're looking at the effect of uh, many predators attacking these uh, prey, whereas we are testing only the effect of chickens, right? So what we have been trying to do is use the same wing patterns as what Ritzvika used, take them out, pin them onto trees with uh, either mealworms or earthworms and check whether they, we get the same results or not. So, so far the uh, experiment has been unsuccessful, but the idea 
the you know, the motivation behind this experiment was exactly what was asked in this question. It's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. it would be interesting yeah. to test that. Yes, yes. Uh, I hope we answer all the question. Uh, we don't There's have... one that just came up on the yeah, chat okay, box. Yeah. Yes, yes. Do iridescent spot patterns decrease predation? So. A lot of these eye spots have some iridescence, but I'm not sure if there are uh, eye spot like pattern which are completely iridescent. You know, they usually have some pigmentation. So I don't think anyone has studied the effect of iridescence on off particular wing patches, as far as I know. I know that a lot of people have been interested in iridescence and how it affects predation and so on, but I don't think anyone has studied it in the context of eye spots. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think we answered all questions. We completed all the questions. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we can wind up. Thank, thanks, thanks again, uh, Dr. Ullasa. Okay. Uh, so we will get you back with compliments uh, for this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.